So this poem uh, is an elegy, was published in 1916 after the death of uh, Benjamin Johnson's son um, due to the plague aged seven. Uh, So the poem is richly biographical as many of the poems in our relationship anthology are. It is written in heroic couplets, which means that the last word of every two lines rhymes. So you can see we have joy, boy, payday, why envy. Um, It's a half rhyme, but it's it's still a rhyming couplet. Uh, Each of these rhyming couplets is written in iambic pentameter, um, as you can see. So that means it's farewell, thou child of my right hand and joy. So heroic couplets. Um, so every two lines rhymes and they're written in iambic pentameter this is evidence of ben johnson's deep passion and his contemplation over the loss of his son as you can imagine this event was devastating and therefore it's unsurprising that he would write a poem that's so regular and controlled and it's such a formal structure because it provides him with a framework to express his grief Um, He begins the poem with a greeting, farewell, um, an archaic way of saying goodbye. And so, of course, he is speaking to his son. The narrative perspective of this poem is a grieving father speaking to his dead son. And he calls this son, thou child of my right hand, which is the meaning of the name Benjamin in Hebrew. And it infers favoritism um, or righteousness that he thought his son was commendable and unworthy of praise and obviously of this poem. He uses extensive religious imagery then, as you can imagine, in the 17th century. Um, England itself was, was highly religious, highly Christian. And therefore, he uses religious imagery in order to bring comfort um, and offer hope and a way forward through this loss. Uh, He uses the word sin, um, which is quite incongruous to the idea of loss. Incongruous means it doesn't fit. Uh, But he thinks that his sin was that he hoped too much of his son. He loved him too much because seven years his son was loaned or lent to him and he now pays Um, and these juxtaposing concepts lent and paid are reflective of his attitudes towards God because he believes that God loaned his son to him for seven years and now he pays and and in a sense I suppose returns the favour. So these are juxtaposing concepts which are linked to God and his attitudes towards God. He feels that it is just, that means right um, or correct, that it's fair for God to do this because in a Christian ideology, he believes that God, um, in a sense, owns or has agency or control over all of his people. Uh, He begins his his next part of the poem with apostrophe, um, this exclamation of O, um, which was highly typical of Elizabethan poetry, uh, this apostrophe that he uses. It just means a dramatic outburst or an exclamation. And it shows um, his his rich emotional investment in his poem, further underlined through the... um, the exclamation mark at the end of that statement and the sejura, which is a pause in the middle of a line of poetry, which underlines his emotional excess. Um, He wonders, could I lose all father now? Which means, oh, that I had never been a father because this pain is so great. Um, And yet he goes on to ask himself the question, why will man lament the state he should envy. That word lament means to feel sad about something. And he asks himself this dramatic rhetorical question where he wonders why, why he is sad that his son is dead because of course he believes that his son is in heaven. And this reflects this Elizabethan belief in God's will being the best way for all people. 
And he realizes that he shouldn't be sad that his son is dead um, because he is now in a better place. And he gives three reasons in particular why he shouldn't be sad. Because his son has skipped, again, an archaic way of saying escaped, and he shortens it so that it fits with the iambic pentameter meter. He says that his son has escaped worlds and flesh's rage. Um, now, the world's rage is, of course, all of the suffering that we go through today and that Benjamin Johnson would have went through in his day, um, famine, drought, illness, disease. And then the flesh's rage was another way of saying sin. Um, so lust, gluttony, jealousy, uh, all of those negative emotions that so plague the human race. And finally... Even if he didn't experience the world's rage and the flesh's rage, he would have aged. He would have gotten older um, and suffered in that way. And so he gives a tripartite list of everything that his son avoids um, by dying and realises that that state is preferable, that it's better for his son. Um and this is, of course, also personification, worlds and flesh's rage. Um, so he personifies that to make it seem like a bigger threat, uh, something that's worse for his son. And in this, I suppose, concluding section of his poem, he begins with the imperative, rest in soft peace. And that sibilant, let me just write that down, sibilant imperative is highly comforting and accepting of all that his son has been through and all that he has been through as a result of his son's death and realises that his son was his best piece of poetry. And it's a beautiful metaphor which celebrates his son's life and all that his son meant to him, saying, you were my best piece of poetry. This is a highly flattering and celebratory tone, um, showing his gratitude for the seven years that he had, even though his son is, of course, now dead. He concludes his poem with a beautiful epigram, which means his kind of concluding thoughts and argues that because of the, the immense grief and suffering that he experienced due to his son's death, he now vows or promises that what he loves, he may never like too much. And that simply means that he resolves to, I suppose, contain or restrain his emotional investment in whatever he loves and likes because the pain of losing a loved one is is too great and he claims to have learnt from this experience to understand that it is better by far not to become too emotionally invested because the pain is too great um so a very a very poignant um and emotionally rich poem